Oh, good morning, everyone. Glad you could be here. As you can see, we're in Matthew chapter 3. I know Sterling said Phil was going to be teaching today, and Phil is going to be teaching in here. It's not just a rumor, but because of our schedules and juggling those, we have... Uh, I'm back up here. I'm going to be out of town for a while, and then in November, gone, so kind of back and forth. Just a quick recap over some of the things that we've been talking about in here so far. First, here is our uh, schedule, or at least the next few classes, and if you would like a paper version of the schedule, we have those at the back. Uh, so... Largely, as Sterling said, we're going to be going chapter by chapter with a slowdown, some slowdown in chapters 5 through 7 with the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll get into Wednesday night. All right, so we've been talking about in these first seven chapters this announcing or revealing of the king, the kingdom, Messiah. Emmanuel, and especially the first three chapters are focusing on connecting Jesus to the Old Testament, to these promises and prophecies that we see in the Old Testament. And so we've gone over several of those. We've talked about how Jesus is descended from David, and he's not just descended from David, but he's descended through kings, and all the way then back from David descended from Abraham. You know, one thing I meant to bring out last Sunday, and I've forgotten someone had made this point, I think it's a good one, that one of the things in his list here, you say, well, there are good kings, there are bad kings that preceded Jesus, but even the good kings, even Josiah and Hezekiah, they had their weaknesses. What Matthew then begins to present here and throughout this gospel is a king without weakness, without the flaws. He doesn't have Hezekiah's moments of weakness. And so it's a very powerful, I think, continuation of what we've seen, but something greater, as we've seen also with a greater Moses, which is really in many ways chapter 2. Well, let me back up and say we also see Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and this emphasis of him, God, man, God with us, Emmanuel. Then in chapter two, we see that a question that may have arisen to many Jewish readers would have been, well, wait a minute, Jesus, he's Jesus of Nazareth. But Matthew helps them to see, no, he's really Jesus of Bethlehem. He is from the city of David, not just descended, but born in the city of David, as promised in the prophets. And then that he escaped the massacre of the innocents and was called out of Egypt. Again, these these were references that to any Jewish reader would have immediately connected him to this prophet that would be like Moses, that Moses prophesied about in Deuteronomy. Then we get into, let let me back up here. I meant to, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, As we've emphasized, I think it's pretty clear in reading the gospel that Matthew was originally writing to people who would have known a lot about the Old Testament. These promises would have mattered to them. And, but the question is, how does that How does that hit us today? Well, many of us here, sitting here, would know a lot about God's promises, and that would be meaningful for us too. But what about somebody who picks up Matthew and is is doesn't know about all these promises? What what is this message to them? Where did this Where does the idea of Messiah come from? Where did the idea of a king that would follow in the steps of David? Where did the idea of a second Moses 
again, you know, many, you know, there's Jesus seminar and Jesus workshop and Jesus this and that and the other thing. And there are, you know, all these sort of reconstructions of what the true historical Jesus and a lot of, you know, suggesting, well, these ideas were just invented by writers and his disciples. But where did, where are these ideas of kingship and the second Moses, where they come from? Well, they just didn't drop out of the air that these first century Jewish readers, they knew of these. And even Jesus' opponents, even people like Herod, were aware that there had been prophecies and these messianic prophecies, some of them were very puzzling to them. You know, the ones that Jesus quotes, you know, the Lord said of my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Well, they recognized that as messianic, but it was very confusing and puzzling to them. But I think this is a real message to someone who would pick up this book. And yeah, they may have to go back and figure out, well, what, what, what is he referencing here? But I think that's a very important part of the gospel, that the idea of king, Messiah, this isn't just an invention of the first or second century. You know, this, is, this has been building for 2,000 years to Abraham and 1,000 years from David and 700 years from Isaiah, right? Then... We get to chapter 3. And, you know, if you sort of pick this up and you don't think about the overall organization, you go, well, we're hopping from the story of Jesus' birth to hopping over here at John the Baptist. But again, what is John the Baptist doing? Right. Preparing the way. He's announcing the king. He's making paths straight, as we'll see, that this is a continuation of what Matthew has been doing in chapters 1 and 2. Hey, the king and the kingdom are coming. And now he lets John speak for this. As we see, about the time, that time, John the Baptist began preaching in the desert area of Judea, and John said, Change your hearts and lives because the kingdom of heaven is near. I use this particular version because repent, as much as we read of the Bible, has turned into a Bible word, a church word. How many of you use the word repent in this past week? How many of you in the last month have used the word change? That's the word we use, and that's what he's saying. You need to change. You need to change your ways because the kingdom of heaven is near. It's a very interesting idea that we'll get into of John's mission. But what's John announcing? Well, God's kingdom is right here. And so Matthew again is letting John tell us that the kingdom is being revealed. John's an interesting character, prophesied about in Isaiah. Prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him or make his path straight, as many verses would put it. Why, why have John? Why not just have Jesus? Yeah, Elisha had Elijah. <laughs> did, you know, one thing I think did, did, does Jesus need a forerunner? Well, apparently, <laughs> that here Isaiah, you know, getting what what role is he doing? What is he doing for the people of Israel? 
getting them ready, getting their minds prepped, getting them thinking in this direction, opening, beginning to open minds, beginning to open hearts, getting them prepared. Now, again, he, he didn't just come out of nowhere. Uh, but in some ways, it looked like he did. So here's a description. You all can read it. What is this a description of? Now, this interesting thing, as we've seen already, Matthew quotes from the Old Testament fairly frequently. In fact, I was going to back up this quotation here is from the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. If you read in your Bibles, based largely on the Hebrew manuscripts, a Masoretic text, there's light variation. Just a little side note, I will say this is one of the reasons I don't think people should get too worked up about, oh, this version and this, you know, this version is loose and this version, look, I think many Orthodox Jews of the first century would have viewed the Septuagint as well. You know, that's not the Hebrew Bible. The Bible writers and speakers quote from both of them sort of to fit their purposes, not because the message is different. And we'll see this through this book, that the Holy Spirit is presenting a message and that message is consistent in the Septuagint and the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. And so that slight variations in readings, does that undercut the message? Well, no. Sometimes I'm afraid we don't see that, you know, when we get so worked up that, oh, you've got to have this version or that version's a little, we're actually acting as if God's word is fragile. God's word is not fragile. God's word can be translated into Greek and then into English and still the same message. It can be translated directly from Hebrew and still give you the same message. So I'll get off that soapbox here. So John, who? There are many quotations that we've seen already, but Matthew also and the other gospel writers, but particularly Matthew, makes references that aren't direct quotations that Jewish readers would have understood even though he's not saying this was said. So who is John reflecting? Elijah. In what ways? What, what descriptions here would point a Jewish reader in the first century and say, hey, this is this second coming of Elijah. His clothes, and, and the fact not only the camel's hair, but this belt around his waist that was sort of figured prominently in Elijah's story. You know, what he ate, you know, his whole demeanor. And in fact, where do we see, even though he... Matthew doesn't quote this. Why should we be expecting someone like Elijah? Right. From Malachi, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Again, John the Baptist isn't just out of the blue. This last inspired writing that we know about from the Old Testament, 400 years before these events, is saying Elijah is coming back. And I think, again, figuratively saying, someone very much like Elijah is coming back and he's going to be doing exactly what John is doing here. His preaching will turn the hearts of the Father. His preaching will lead to change and repentance, right? 
So, in fact, one of the things here is interesting. Mark's gospel actually does quote for Balak. So you can see that, well, this isn't just, oh, you know, we're, we're connecting these two. That Matthew doesn't quote it, but I think would have known people would have understood this. Well, who shows up next? This is this was as good of a picture as I could come up with for this. So who shows up in this story next? The Sadducees and Pharisees. Well, why, who are they? Yeah, they're the religious leaders. The Sadducees are the party of the leading priest and the high priest. And so they're the, when we see in scripture references to the chief priest, that's really a, a way of re- referencing the Sadducees. That It would include more than just them, but the chief and leading priest were Sadducees. But the leading sort of religious figures were Pharisees that at least the readings we have suggest that the Pharisees were viewed more favorably than by the people than the Sadducees. They were, they were stricter in many ways. The Sadducees in many ways were viewed as somewhat sellouts to the Romans and maybe too, too chummy with the Romans to protect their position. But here, and it's interesting in Scripture, even though these two groups are off and at odds with each other. They had different views of the Bible. What parts of the Bible did the Sadducees rely on? Just the first, the Torah, the first five books. And then they, they didn't view the prophets and the wisdom literature as authoritative, whereas the Pharisees did. And the Pharisees, again, were less Greekized or Hellenized than the Sadducees. And, and yet, even though they were often in disagreement in their opposition to Jesus, they sometimes become allies. But here they come out to see John. John's out here in the wilderness of Judea, of the Jordan, and he refers to them as a brood of vipers. I've jumped ahead here. I'm not used to this. Could you imagine a more <laughs> demeaning reference? You brood, you den of snakes. And what he says to them Again, it's going to fit into much of what we talk about here. But you can see why John wouldn't be necessarily their favorite preacher. You know, he's, he's saying, you guys are, are trouble. But he tells them then, and the crowd in general, I baptize you with water. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave or carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the wheat from the chaff with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing floor area, gathering the wheat into the barn and burning the chaff with never-ending fire. Well, what's his message here? What, what's implied? What's he beginning to apply? By even using phrases like, you brood of vipers. What's the, here are the religious leaders, but what's John saying is, or at least hinting at, or maybe more than hinting, what's what's going on with them? Part of the preparation that the real authorities 
Yeah. Yeah. These a bit these Sadducees, chief priests, and Pharisees are going to play a very prominent role in this gospel. I mean, we begin to see them repeatedly. And this is, seems to be John, uh, Matthew's way of introducing this important, prominent group. But not just introducing it with Jesus, but letting people see, hey, John, John is letting you know up front how you should be thinking about these people in, in contrast to Jesus. We're going to come back to that. And so we see this, what John's message is here. It's an interesting one. Again, the idea of turning and preparing, but this fra these phrases that he uses here, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What's he getting at there? What, what does that mean? He will baptize you with, again, we, we see references in Acts to, and maybe this is foreshadowing that, you know, this, the Holy Spirit coming on the apostles and baptizing them. But I, my sense is, is John's referencing this even more broadly than just that event. I mean, that's an important part of this. Think about it. What? The Holy Spirit is a person. He's a part of God. But if you take the term Holy Spirit, literally, what is, okay, holy, you know, this, but spirit, what is a spirit? What is our spirit? I know that's a, you can go lots of directions with that. Literally, we would use, or they would have used the similar word to refer to breath. God's breath, the wind of God. The, now again, the, we see the Holy Spirit in Scripture representing, or being, not just representing, but being, the presence of God and the empowering presence of God. And so he's going, he's saying, he will baptize you with the presence, this empowering, powerful presence presence of God. He's going to baptize you with his very breath and with fire. Now, you know, I, I, over the years, I sort of could get my head around baptizing you with the Holy Spirit, but what does he mean with baptizing you with fire? Well, again, Matthew is making reference to Old Testament works that I think they would have been familiar with. And the baptizing you with the Holy Spirit, I think it, most many people here would, and your minds would run what? The day of Pentecost and Peter's referencing of Joel, the prophet Joel, who said, then after doing all those things, I will pour out. So this is a whole section about God's restoration of his people in very poetic language. And then after doing all of those things I've been talking about, I will pour out my spirit upon all people and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. And so, you know, the day of Pentecost is the, is the beginning of this outpouring. And John is referencing. And so it's going to bring refreshing and restoration. You, you think about it as, again, beyond just the ability of the apostles to speak in other languages and, and the great sound of rushing wind, but it's it's the idea of God's breath, God's presence 
going throughout the world bringing healing, bringing salvation, bringing the restoration of everything that God has talked about. But what about this fire business? What? Yeah. Right. And that's exactly what, if, you, if we go back to Malachi, that's how he uses it. That purification, judgment. There we go. Let me back up here. Huh? Yeah, somebody, I may have to let Julia start running this. I'm having. So, but who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire. Now, this is in reference to the one who's coming after Elijah the prophet. For he will be a blazing fire that refines metal or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver burning away the dross. And in some of the very last words of the Old Testament, the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, all. Again, this coming of the one Elijah the prophet is speaking about. Well, this is what the end of Malachi ends with. This, now, it's, it's four centuries later, and so you begin wondering, well, is this going to happen? And so in this, again, I, I don't think this is, one can certainly use it for an end time reference, but his reverence here, again, is more broad than that, I think. It's the idea that Jesus is coming is both, both going to bring refreshing and restoration is going to be great blessing but it's also going to bring judgment he's going to indict the world he's going to indict kingdoms and people and who are under the power of evil and satan and so again we see throughout this gospel, this conflict of kingdoms, judgment coming on kingdoms and leaders and religious leaders and those following them who are not in tune with God's spirit and the coming Messiah. Well, then this section gets to the last part. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. And he said, so why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done for we must fulfill all righteousness. Now, before I get into that, just think about that one writer I was reading up. I thought had a good analogy John has been building up the coming Messiah. You know, he's been playing the role of Elijah. And this commentator said, you know, you can imagine the, you know, the sort of the MC, the person, you know, sort of the person coming out before the big musician is uh, to appear. You've been waiting on them. You've wanted to see them. And they're here tonight. Now, you know, for different people, maybe for some of you that would have been Frank Sinatra. I don't know, for Julia, it might have been some poison, some 1980s hair band. I don't know, you know, others here might have other, you know, Van Halen or whoever, I don't know, Daryl saying who? Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> you know, it makes sense with your shirt choices, Daryl. Right? Not, not today, but you're... But you can imagine, you know, you're really building this up and you, know, you, you, you people are going to be blown away. He's going to baptize you with the spirit and with fire. And then what do we see? Yeah, you know, the commentator sort of suggesting, well, then the musician comes out and he has a clarinet. 
And he comes up to the MC and says, come over here. I want you to sing a song first. And <laughs> the MC would be going, well, what? You know, it's interesting. John, we don't know how much, even though they're cousins, how much Jesus and John had interacted. It's not hard to imagine that they had met. And John knew some things about Jesus. And yet, John's message is so powerful about coming Messiah and what he's going to do. And then the king himself comes. And as we see later in, in the other gospels too, what does this create, not just for other people, but for John? It's it's puzzling. He ends up sitting in prison and he sends messages to Jesus asking what? Are you the one? And, and in some ways that's puzzling. So well, how do, when he, what do you mean are you the one? You've said, here's the Lamb of God. You know, you've said, you know, that you've recognized who he is. That, but in that way, is it John, is it that different from us. We go through waves of thoughts and emotions and, you know, you're convinced of something and then things happen. You think, well, is this, is this really the thing? And so Jesus comes in not some grand, you know, entourage or not speaking, you know, you know, with flames coming out of his mouth and, you know, some big guitar solo, he comes to be baptized by John. The king comes to submit to what everybody else is doing. And then he makes this statement and to explain it to John. Now, John seems to accept it, but it we need to do this so we can fulfill all righteousness. I have to admit, over the years, I, I've, and it's been one of the phrases, I thought, well, I'll take it at face value, but I don't really know what that means. And thought about it, read up some, and let me give you a suggestion, and, and uh, if many of you may already be thinking these way. You may be way ahead of me in this, you know, but by saying it should be done to fulfill all righteousness, we've talked about Jesus as key. We've talked about him as the second Moses. What was the other figure or position that we've talked about, Jesus holds. Emmanuel, God with us. So he's God, but he's not just living here. You think about, he's one of us. God as one of us. How does this illustrate that idea? Well, all these people who are listening to John and are touched by his message and have decided to change their lives, they're going out in multitudes to be baptized by John. And what is Jesus illustrating by doing this? I am one of you. I am with you. And particularly, I think then you think about this, what does that stand in contrast to in chapter 3? Well, what was the, how does Matthew describe, not, not the brood of hyper statement, but how does he describe what the scribes, what were the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees doing out here? Yeah, they weren't coming to be changed. They weren't coming to 
submit to this baptism, they were coming to Lord. They were coming to be above it all. They were coming to, oh, what's going on here? God. And you see the contrast that Matthew sets, sets up? The king, in his kingdom, he's one of the people. Your religious leaders, the people that are ultimately going to be responsible for killing Jesus, they're not with you. It's interesting because the Pharisees, and that would have been one of the distinctions between the scribes, the fair, excuse me, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, would have been that the Pharisees were viewed in many respects as more with the people. You know, they're they're not buddy buddy with the Romans, and yeah, okay, they're a bit austere. They got a lot of rules, but yeah, they they did so frequently see this in scriptures, view themselves as above the people, lording it over them, as Paul, Paul, Paul said. And so it's a very vivid, I think, way of Matthew trying to set up Jesus differently. Now, I think one of his main points then is here at the end, really, and all, it's interesting, this, this is one of the stories, or one of these aspects of the story that all the Gospels seem to highlight. And that at that moment, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, who I, who I love, and with whom I'm well pleased. This idea of God's voice God's validating, a voice from heaven validating who this is. Now, it's a bit fuzzy as to exactly who sees and understands this. I, I meant to look back. I, I, I'm looking at the di different gospel accounts. I've forgotten which one. But one of them, I think, most clearly indicates that it's really John that fully sees this. I'm not sure everyone is hearing or seeing all of this. Maybe they're seeing the dove. But it's John who comes to fully appreciate that this is the voice from heaven. And so it's a, yeah, you back up and you start thinking about chapter three as part of this whole chapters one through seven. The revealing of Jesus, the announcing of Jesus. Who is this guy? Well, here is letting John and the contrast of John and the Pharisees and Sadducees, letting all of them tell us who is this Jesus. Well, it's a, it's a really uh, quite a I, I hate to be sound like I'm standing in judgment on Matthew's writing, but I, I'm appreciating it, not judging it. But it's so beautifully crafted and well constructed and just building blocks upon each other. And I think, you know, I hope all of us, again, we're not first century Jews. Many of us know a lot about the Old Testament. You know, this idea that Jesus didn't just drop out of the blue. And that people like John, he himself had been prophesied about. And if you happen to be here and don't know a lot about the Old Testament, don't know many of these references, beginning to let that sink into you of thinking, you know, this, this is a story that isn't just made up in the first or second century. This is a story that's been building for centuries and now is being unveiled. Anybody have any additional comments you might want to make about chapter three here? You're talking about the brood of vipers and who they were. I think there's also a strong um, leading in of the evil and that they're Satan because what's happening in chapter three? Yeah, yeah. Marla is saying this reference to brood of vipers and it seems, you know, to saying something that's strong is a way of connecting them with evil, 
with Satan. And as she said, then that begins to be this lead in to chapter four, because often chapter four is like, well, why and this is dropped in out of the blue <laughs> with this Satan and Jesus temptation. But you see in this way, identifying subtly, well, maybe not so subtly with statements like prude of vipers, but identifying this kingdom as saying things and pulling in the same direction that Satan himself is pulling in the next chapter. Yeah, that's a, it's a helpful idea, Paula. Until I, I started studying a little bit about this, I never recognized John the Baptist as the last prophet. I thought he was the prophet. Yeah, yeah. No, the, right. Yeah. Thank you for your good attention. Phil, I think we'll be here Wednesday night, right?